you have your Bibles uh, this morning, if you want to turn to Ephesians chapter 5 with me, Ephesians chapter 5, and uh, we will um, just going to kind of want to read this uh, together for you as we start. This will be kind of our main focus, uh, these two little verses, but trust me, we're going to read several other verses around the context of Ephesians 5, and so let's just kind of read this this morning before we uh, pray. Follow God's example. Therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Um, can we pray? Father, I, uh, I thank you for my people who have chosen to be with us this morning collectively as this beautiful church body that we call Gulf View Grace. And Lord, I don't know what maybe some of the challenges are that they're being faced with this morning, but God, I just pray that in these next few moments that you would just allow them to push aside some of the distractions, some of those things that are taking up headspace, and just to totally focus on you and to sit with you and to ask that your Holy Spirit would just speak over us, we pray. And so God, we, we humbly pray for the help of the Holy Spirit to help us to listen, to help us to lean in, and to see what it is that you might be teaching each of us here this morning. And God, help us to not just be hearers of the word this morning, but help us to take action and to be doers of the word this morning. And we will give you the praise and the glory. And God, I trust that you won't leave me up here alone. So I'm asking that your Holy Spirit would speak through me as well. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So today, again, we begin this kind of new, short, uh, three-part series in the book of Daniel. Just joking. <laughs> All right. Um, we finished Daniel, and now we kind of start this kind of new ride. In January 2020, we shared with our church about kind of our, our new mission and our values, and, and vision was a part of that. That's another story. We'll talk about that another day. But that happened in 2020, if you are part of our church family. If you recall, we were meeting in the Family Life Center at that time going through this, um, um, this 2020 vision. It just so happened to be the year 2020, and we were also sharing with our church family about our mission and our values. And then the, the purpose really over during that time, it was a two-year period that we had a, a team that, that kind of came together and kind of re-clarified our mission as a church. It was clear to us that our church had a mission because our, our church was going somewhere, but we kind of felt like in some ways that our mission got a little sidestepped, got a little, um, you know, left off to the um, you know, to the edges. And so we needed to kind of reclarify and kind of regain some focus. And so we did that in 2020. And so you may remember this, hopefully you do, because this is our mission statement. One thing that we're lacking at this point is we don't have this up in our foyer yet. It's been something that's been a goal of ours to kind of get this somewhere displayed in the back because um, this is really who we are and who we, who we feel God is calling us to be as the, as the Gulfy family. And so we are a family devoted to reflect the love of Christ, rescue the lost to Christ, and to renovate our life in Christ. Can we just say that all together again? We'll start. A family devoted to reflect the love of Christ, rescue the lost to Christ, and renovate our life in Christ. We simply took what, what we believe was God's kind of profound and powerful words that we kind of gained through Scripture as we were, as a team came together and, and read several, several passages of Scripture trying to wrap our head around this idea of what has God called the church to do and what specifically do we feel God has called our church to do. And so we took God's word and kind of rearranged them on, on paper in a way that we feel speaks to, communicates in our culture and speaks to us here in our church family context today. And so we wanted something that moves us. We wanted something that really motivates us, something that compels us at living on mission, on God's mission, and as the mission of the Gulf View family. When we first formulated this mission, um, that we, we again believe that God has divinely and providentially orchestrated for us. We never wanted this to be, you know, here Paul is, follow him and his mission. It's not really about my mission. It's not about my vision. It, it's about what we believe God is, is calling us to be as, as uh, his people. And so um, that's kind of been what we kind of um, decided from the beginning. And so we made a decision early on that we would periodically and regularly kind of rehearse this mission statement. We didn't want this to just be something you post on your fridge, but we had this little catchphrase. We wanted it to be something that you post on your heart. 
I want it to be something that's etched on your heart that you don't forget and you remember every morning when you wake up or go to the fridge because that's where my magnet is. If you didn't get one of these magnets, we still have them. Today, those in our membership class, you're going to get some magnets. And every time you're hungry or going to grab a drink, boom, you open the fridge and there it is. And that's how it is in our house. We still have it kind of slapped to the side of our fridge and it reminds us of really what our mission is. As we attended several classes going through our mission and and vision, and we had other kind of groups, a a national organization within our fellowship of churches that kind of walked with us during this time, and they said, you cannot over-communicate your mission to your people. And so we believe that, and so we want to make sure that we take, again, these periodic moments where we just kind of, you know, step out of, of... of just take a break from Daniel as before we get ready to move on to something new and just refresh our hearts and our minds about what our mission is. We want you to know that everything we do uh, is filtered kind of through this mission statement. So often we have grand ideas, and often we have lots of people that come to us with grand ideas, and God gives us creativity, and we love that. But we take those ideas and we, we ask ourselves, is that going to help us further our mission, who God has called us to be? And so we take that little um, idea, and we kind of filter it through our mission statement to make sure that it's going to fit, because not everything is going to fit with what we believe God's called us to do. And so today begins kind of this refresher study, but we're going to make this new and and hopefully um, a learning experience for you as well um, And uh, as we study the Gulf View mission together. And so we're going to use Ephesians chapter 5 to do that. We've never done this before when we've looked at this, um, looked at our mission before, Um, We've never looked at Ephesians 5 as a part of it, so this will be hopefully something um, new uh, for you. And the first word that we're going to reflect on in this three-part series is this idea of reflecting the love of Christ, reflecting the love of Christ. If you've attended our church for any length of time, then you know that that I am one that, that loves context, and I think what birthed that within my heart is um, I was in a Moody Bible Institute course many, many, many years ago. I, trust me, I'm a little older than you probably think I am. Um, and I was in a course, and we had a professor. We had some other people here in the mix who were a part of that course many years ago. I'll never forget what my professor told us as we were studying the Word, beginning to kind of dive into some really um, cool passages of Scripture He said, there are three very important details that you must always remember when you're studying God's word. And then he said, and I remember him getting his fingers, he said, context, context, context. He goes, you you have to remember the context of that passage that you're studying. Or if not, a lot of people like to do what we call proof texting. They'll take a verse out of the middle of the Bible and they'll just make this verse say something that it really doesn't say if you're looking at the context. And so that's probably one of the reasons why I love context, because um, of that professor, Professor Aaron Webb, who helped us kind of learn about context. And there was a passage in Acts that had changed my life when I heard Pastor Aaron Webb kind of share this story. I've shared this with you before. Um, It's the story of Eutychus. And if you've never heard of the story of Eutychus, it's this true story that happens as he encounters Paul, and and it's awesome. Um, But someday you have to read it. It is the crazy off-the-wall story that's kind of parked in the middle of Acts. But when I heard that story for the first time, and Aaron helped me understand the context of what was happening around that story, I'm telling you, it changed my life. It changed my life. That little story, as odd as it is, leaped off the pages for me of Scripture. And then I said to myself, if I am devoting my life to be a pastor, then I want to help Scripture leap off the pages for other people so that they too can have those kinds of moments. It really was powerful for me. So context is where we're at. So before we dive into Ephesians 5, I want us to understand some details about Ephesians 5, and it's hard for me just to hop in anywhere without giving you some surrounding detail, and some of you love that, and some of you just put in your headphones, I know. Um, And so here's where we're at. And so we last did a book study, by the way, in Ephesians back in 2014. That was like the start of me as the lead pastor here, and that was the first sermon series we did was in the book of Ephesians. We kind of together studied the book of Ephesians. Maybe three of you remember that. Um, I don't know. Um, Four, if you're counting me. And so this was, again, that first sermon series that I did as, um, as a pastor. And here, Paul, the Apostle Paul, is writing to a church. And so the book of Ephesians I'm just kind of going over these details. Some of you may know this, and that's great. Others of you may not, and and that's great too. We're glad you're here. And so as Paul's writing this letter, 
He's writing this to a church that's located in a place called Ephesus. And so it's the city of Ephesus, and it's a letter that's written to a specific church that's meeting in the city of Ephesus. And so just making sure that we kind of all understand that. And so that's why it's called Ephesians. If Paul was writing a letter to us, Port Richians, I don't know. Um, it might be the Gulf, Gulf Uians. I don't know what he would call it, but that's some similar ideas on what's happening. And so here, Paul is writing to this church in Ephesus. He's writing to encourage them, specifically, catch this, on how to live for Jesus in a place like Ephesus. Ephesus, here's some little details, was a city that was fascinated with magic, uh, occult kind of details or, and things, practices would be happening and pretty rampant. There were temples erected to various gods and goddesses, the most famous being the goddess of Artemis. Maybe you've heard of the goddess of Artemis. Diana, was, she was also known to the Romans. And there were regular places of worship where you would go to offer even a little pinch of incense, maybe one day we'll talk about this in a couple of weeks, um, a pinch of incense, and as you would offer your pinch of incense, you would declare that Caesar is Lord. And what this new church is beginning to learn is that Caesar isn't Lord, Jesus is Lord. And so you can begin to already see some of the challenges that this church is going to have. When everybody else is acknowledging that Caesar is Lord, this church is saying, "Uh uh-uh, that doesn't work with us because we believe that Jesus is Lord. Um, This was also a place that sexual immorality uh, abounded, was virtually unrestrained. We'll talk about that in another week as well. Um, And so this sounds a lot of similarities to Daniel, doesn't it? There's a lot of overlap here when we think about um, Daniel's story, except Daniel was kind of taken from his homeland and forced into exile and to adopt these values that weren't godly. In this case, this is the city that you and I, let's say, would live in, and all of a sudden, these are the values that we're living in, but we encounter Jesus. He changes our life, and now we're challenged with, well, how in the world do I behave in Ephesus? Or how in the world do I behave in Pasco? county. And so this is kind of what's happening. We're no longer talking about Babylon. We've now stepped out of Babylon, right? And so now we're kind of being whisked over to Ephesus. Now, as we come to the New Testament and we try to understand the context of the book of Ephesians, I want us to grasp a bit more of, of, again, city life here in what um, Ephesus was like. The book of Ephesians is And we'll get to some of that too, but I also want us to understand kind of how the book is is written because that's helpful to us, especially when we're diving right in to chapter four and five, kind of right in the middle. Um, Ephesians, you could say, if you were to do an outline of this book, you could kind of chop it almost directly in half. Um, And so some people like to use, pastors love catchy words because we remember catchy words. And so um, some um, people that you reference and some theologians, they'll say it all has to do with doctrine and duty. So say doctrine Doctrine. and duty. Duty. So some people say Ephesians kind of divides kind of like that. Other people say it's call, say call, Call. and conduct. Conduct. They both really mean the same thing. It just depends on what other kind of word phrases you want. Or even some even say it's about your faith and then it's about your practice, you know, practicing your faith. And so literally right down the middle, the first three chapters we could say are all talking about our call are all talking about who we are in Christ. And we could even say whose we are, right? We're His. And, and so those first three chapters are about the doctrinal beliefs of who we are and the call that He's given to us as His sons and daughters, right? And so it's about our identity, those three chapters. The, the, the last three chapters, chapter four through six, is where we're going to park for a little bit, um, is really our conduct. It's our responsibility as a result of what we believe. So because of the doctrines that we believe, because of the faith that we believe, because of what we read from Scripture, that should, with the power of the Holy Spirit, begin to change our lives, and now we begin to behave, conduct, right, in a different way. And so we can try to be as good as we can, but we can't be good enough. We need Jesus to radically change our life, and then we should see as an overflow of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, the conduct of our life should begin to become proof of who lives inside of us, right? And so it's that outward sign, our conduct, of what's happening inwardly within 
our body as believers. And so these last three chapters, again, are this, the conduct of these believers. And so you now know who you are, you now know whose you are, and those are the first three chapters. And now because of that, this is how you should conduct yourself. And so we could say, you and I represent the family of God, you and I represent the Gulf U Grace family that we're all a part of right now, wherever you go, wherever you eat, wherever you shop, wherever you play. And so the question would become, what kind of a reputation are you helping God to create for His family? What type of a reputation are you helping us to create as a part of the Gulf U Grace family? Do people say, oh, there goes one of those Gulf U family members from that church down Hammock Road. I love them. Or do people say, oh, there goes one of them Gulf U Grace church family members that parked down at the end of Hammock Road? You know, and it, I don't know. So what do they say when they see you coming around? Hopefully it's the first, right? And not the second one. And the Apostle Paul, who's the author of this book of Ephesians, is kind of laying this foundational framework for us as he's addressing this to the church of Ephesus, and I believe he's addressing this to the church of Gulf View Grace this morning, all right? And so the big problem is that too many Christians, I think, tend to live their lives in the first three chapters of Ephesians. I think too many Christians are all caught up with, let's just kind of learn and let's just grow, and it's just kind of you and me, God, been our four walls behind this church, and that's just great. And that is great, but there's a lot more to the picture than just learning and growing is not just for your own personal sake, but it's also for the sake of the kingdom, right? It's also for the sake of reflecting the love of Christ to those that we come in contact with as we want to now take what we're learning and how we're growing and then throw that out to our community. And so too many Christians today, I think, understand that I'm lavishly loved and extremely rich in grace but we are living our lives as if we're deficient and poor. And so we come and we study God's Word, and then we walk around the rest of the week like this, right? And probably not. I'm exaggerating, but you get it. Um, and so now what we are going to do in this little study is um, just one chapter, well, two, four and five, we're going to look at together, merging some of these things together on this conduct section of what the Apostle Paul's letter is to this church I'm assuming that we as a large majority in the Gulfy family, that, that, we're, that we're beginning to, we know who we are, we know whose we are, and so we're just kind of fast forwarding now to this conduct section. You know that you've been saved by grace um, through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross, and now because of it, as he's transforming your life, you want to help to now affect um, other lives through your conduct because you're a walking example, a walking billboard of God and a walking billboard of our church family. Um, in February, I had the opportunity uh, to study in the country of Turkey, and much of our focus of that trip was studying the seven churches that we read in Revelation chapter 1 and chapter 2. Um, and one of those stops that we were able to make, yes, was Ephesus. And so we were able to study with another group of pastors in literally the city, the ruins of Ephesus. If you've never been there, I would say book a flight now when you have to go, okay? It is awesome. Um, and so that was one of the highlights of our trip. In fact, that was the last city of the seven that we studied on our trip was there landing kind of in Ephesus. And as a part of being there in the city of Ephesus, um, kind of the, the person who kind of led our, our tours, Dr. Randy Smith, um, you know, we, we studied, while in Ephesus, we studied the book of Ephesians, and so it was so cool to do that, like a fast-forward version, like no doubt, but still, nonetheless, we studied it. Little side note, coming up in September, Randy Smith is going to be leading us through the book of Revelation as a seminar. We're going to be announcing those details soon. It'll be a Friday, a Saturday, and a Sunday, and just kind of just throwing that out there, and uh, we hope that you'll sign up for that. Randy is amazing at what he does. He's an unbelievably gifted communicator, and uh, you will love him, and I hope that you'll have a part of that with us again coming up soon. And what we learned when we were studying kind of on this amazing site there of Ephesus, we learned is that what the Apostle Paul is doing is he's doing something very unique and something very um, profound and awesome here in this book as he's beginning to share his letter in these passages in what we call the conduct section. And Paul is helping us to understand how you and I behave 
as followers of Jesus while we live in a pagan city like Ephesus. Again, the similarities of Daniel. And Paul is going to give us what I'm going to call slices of life examples from the Roman streets of Ephesus. And so I'll say that again because this is what Paul's going to do. He's going to talk about these various things that we should be doing in the conduct of our Christian lives. And he's going to use imagery and examples, slices of life, right, that are from the Roman streets of Ephesus. And so that's kind of what he's going to do and help us to understand. And I believe this is what he was helping those first readers to understand. And so when they were reading um, these passages about this conduct, I think immediately their brains were clicking. I know exactly what Paul's talking about, right? And often scripture has done that. That's why context, context, context is so important because if you understand the context, it just makes so much sense. And so we come to this beginning of the conduct section in chapter four, and this is what Paul says. He goes, as a prisoner for the Lord, remember this is a part of the the prison epistles or the prison letters. And so Paul's writing this while he's awaiting trial. And that's why he's saying here, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you, this is an urgent matter. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Now, this word worthy means according to your price or value. Think about it again. So Paul says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling. And it means worthy of the price or value. Worthy of your price or value. And Paul, from what I'm learning as I spent some time in Ephesus and listened to others and listened to Randy share, and so this is one way that we can interpret what Paul is doing to help us to understand this, and it makes quite a bit of sense. Um, and so here he's using some examples of this life from the Roman world, and he's using what we believe uh, is an example of what's called the commercial agora. And the commercial agora is another way of saying the marketplace. And so this would be from marketplace lingo um, that's happening in, in, in um, Ephesus. And so think Walmart, think Home Depot, right? Think all the other places where you love to shop. Or better yet, I would say, think an outdoor mall. If you've ever been to an outdoor mall, this is what we would say would be a, a commercial agora where you would go shopping in the city of Ephesus. And here in the commercial market, there would be several things that would take place. I have a picture. This is from Ephesus, um, from uh, when we were there. Um, a lot of those pillars, we believe, are, um, are parts of that. Not the little kind of thing in the back, not that, but just kind of this front area here. And here's kind of another zoomed-in shot of that. I'm just kind of panning left and, or right. And so you can kind of see that this was part of, of this uh, agora, you could say. And uh, as you look at those pictures, um, I'm going to zoom in on another shot here in just a second. Oh, that's just a picture of a cat. Um, it's a Greek cat. Don't get near Greek cats because they're wild. But anyways, here's another kind of a, a video you can kind of see as we just kind of pan kind of what this might look like. Now, in the time of the Ephesians, um, we're going to just keep this picture in your mind about an agora and how it would look. There'd be these pillars on every side or think again, an outlet mall that's a big giant square and you shop in the middle and you go from store to store to store, right? Or in this case, booth to booth to booth, right? And that's kind of how you would kind of do your shopping. And as a part of that, I'm going to digress just for a second and we're going to talk about slave life in Ephesus. Now, slave life in Ephesus would be the norm, but it's not exactly as you and I think of slave life today. Slavery in the Bible was very different from slavery um, that, that we practiced even a few centuries ago, and so I'm not referring to that. Slavery in the Bible was not based on race or other things. Um, people weren't enslaved for their nationality or skin color. In Bible times, slavery was based more on economics it was a matter of social status, and people in Bible times would often sell themselves based on their, their status and how much money they may need in order to pay off their debts. And so, again, people in Bible times would sell themselves as slaves or workers when they could not afford their debts or uh, provide for their families. In New Testament times, 
Um, sometimes even doctors, lawyers, and even politicians were slaves of someone else. So that just helps you to kind of understand when we talk about slaves here, we're talking about a little bit of a different idea on what that means. Now, does that mean that in Bible times that people were never being taken advantage of and or oppressed? No, I, I'm, obviously that was happening as well. God speaks into that in different passages as well in different other places within the Bible. Um, so keep, just keep some of that in mind as we move forward. So now let's go back to the commercial agora here. And if you went to the market to do your shopping on any given day, um, it would be uncommon, it wouldn't be uncommon for you to see uh, or encounter a slave market. Um, and so I want you to picture, you know, those big giant wooden spools that are in the back of the electric company trucks and they have that big massive wire that's wrapped around them. You guys know what I'm talking about? Um, well, take one of those spools and take it off the truck and, and just put it down on the ground. And so it looks like a table. In fact, some people make tables out of those things, right? And so put it on the ground. So picture that you're doing your shopping in the market um, in the commercial market, and then as you turn the corner, you notice and encounter the slave market, and here, standing on one of those spools, we'll call it a turntable, is a person, and that person is standing on the turntable, it's sad to say, probably with no clothes on, but they're, they're wearing a sign, and on their sign, it's called the, the titulus, is the name of their sign that they're wearing, and on their sign, it says what they do, and so my name's Paul, and I'm really good at mosaic tile laying and carpentry work, and I can cook really good meals on the side, right? And there's a gentleman who's then slowly spinning the turntable, and I'm just doing this while I'm holding my side. That sounds like an unbelievably embarrassing situation, doesn't it? Um, does not click with our mind today. We would never even want to be a part of that. And so it shows the humiliation that some of these people put themselves in and how desperate they were in order to get a job. And so here they're spinning around. As they're spinning around, they're holding their sign. And so this, on this giant lazy Susan, you could say, as this is kind of happening. And this is how they would earn a living. This is how they would provide for their family if they weren't in some other area or some other career, and so they needed help. And follow me for a second, because this is what we, some of us believe is quite possibly the imagery that uh, Paul is using here in Ephesians 4, preparing us to launch into 5, um, as we're learning and studying here in Ephesus. And so... As this slave, as you're beginning to spin around and someone decides to choose you, I choose you. Um, he's a strapping man, right? Thanks, I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, so I choose you and I'm going to take him home. And so we're going to kind of put him to work. He looks like a hard worker. And then we read this again in chapter 4, verse 1, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Paul says, I want you to live a life worthy, to walk worthy of your calling, to walk worthy of your titulus, to walk worthy of your sign, and who God says you are. He's talking now to believers here in this church, and in the, in the Roman world, also as a side note, it was um, uh, that uh, it was regulated in tax, and so if you would uh, purchase this person to do carpentry for you, but that person didn't live up to what he or she said they did, then you could return that person and get a full refund right back to Walmart you go, all right? Because they're not living up to what their sign says about them, right? I just thought of that mind blowing. Remember that little comedian, here's your sign? Anyways, um, that wasn't in my notes, by the way. Um, so Paul says, I want you to conduct yourself by walking worthy of the price that was paid for you. Now, you're a believer, you're in the church of Ephesus, and you're hearing this information. What was the price paid for you as a believer? What was the price? Jesus, yeah, his love. Jesus died for us. The unestimable, meaning you can't even estimate it, the unestimable value of the blood of Jesus was the price that was paid for you as a believer. And Paul says, you had better walk worthy according to how much he's paid for you. And we could just stop right there and be like, ooh, I don't know if I'm living 
according to the price that was paid for me. I feel like I mess up a lot. Then Paul shifts gears and he says, I don't want you to just walk worthy of your calling as a believer, but now I want you to be careful that you no longer walk according to your old life that was before you, before you were a believer. That was your old life. And so we fast forward to verse 17 of Ephesians 4, and he says, so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. That's who you were. That's before you were a Christian. That's before Jesus began to radically change your life. And so I I, um, insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in in the futility of their thinking, in their fruitlessness of their thinking, we could say. Paul says, "I, I don't want you to live like your old ways anymore. You have been bought with a price, so live up to the price that has been paid for you. So Paul then shifts kind of from this walking worthy to now this, I need you to walk distinctly. I need you to walk differently. Not just walk worthy of the price paid for you, but I want you to now walk distinctively different from the rest of Ephesus, from the rest of Pasco County, from the rest of the world. You and I need to walk distinctively. Now, If we were touring Ephesus or we lived in Ephesus, there would be something else that we would see that would be a regular part of our day in Ephesus. And so we're living in in Ephesus and we're going to the marketplace and doing our shopping in the outlet mall, and we would also see something like this. Um, Something like this, you can probably begin to figure out what something like this is. And so we would call this the latrine, (laughs) um, where you would relieve yourself, okay? And so a little bit of a mature conversation we have to have here. I'm going to ask you to just kind of be mature with me here because it's just a part of how it works. And so, um, and so this um, latrine would be kind of a part of that life. Here's kind of a zoomed in kind of shot. We just saw this. Again, I just saw this while I was in Turkey in um, Ephesus. And so the room and board was a little under. But I'm just joking. Um, anyways, and so that's some of what we had to do. Interesting enough that before when we studied, um, when we studied kind of culture and context that Remember when Rome ruled the world, that what you would see in Ephesus would be the same that you would see in Corinth, would be the same that you would see in uh, Philippi, wherever you would go, because Rome ruled the world. And so if you'd see a marketplace here and you'd go to another city, it'd be the same thing. What happens in our world today? We go to Tampa, we see a city, we see big, tall buildings, and then we go to Phoenix, we see a city, we see big, tall, right? It's all the same when you go to different places. And so it would be the same. If you went to Israel, this was me in Israel using the latrine. Um, <laughs> Uh, we'll just kind of fast forward through that picture quickly. <laughs> just joking. Um, here's a zoomed out. For those of you who missed it, don't fall asleep because you will miss it, all right? Um, and here's a zoomed out approach. This is Israel now, but Rome ruled the world. And so, it, again, it was the same. Now, a part of the latrine, we would also have something called the baths, okay? And so there would be these baths. We learned that there's, there's caldarium, which would be hot baths um, or like a sauna, um, and I think I have a picture of that, I'm looking on the wrong screen. This is um, one that we saw. This is, again, back to Israel. But um, there would be a, a floor that would be over these things. There would be some kind of a floor, a wooden floor. And they would pump in heat underneath the floor. And you and I would just chill in our sauna, and we would just talk about life, right? And so the bath, the place where you would bath, would be located relatively close to the the train, but somewhat in a central location there. Um, In Ephesus, it was at the beginning, and it was also at the end. And so when you walked through Ephesus, you kind of walked up at the top, and you walked down through and ended out the city on the bottom. And so, and there were, um, on both sides of that, you would see um, where these um, sets of baths were. And so, um, in what do you do when you would go to bath, the baths in Ephesus. Well, some things that you and I would do if we lived there in Ephesus is you would get clean. I mean, that's the first thing that you would do. And so we want to clean ourselves, but also what you would do is you would clean your clothes. So while you're being cleaned, your clothes, your robe, whatever is being cleaned by somebody else while you yourself are being cleaned. Of course, if you had enough money to afford that, not everybody could kind of work in that way. And so if, if you were, um, this is kind of what would be happening here in the baths. And so, but something other very profound would happen in bath time. And I just want you to think, bath time, that's funny. <laughs> I just want you to think Starbucks for a second, and I want you to think coffee time. 
Sometimes I do studying in Starbucks or other coffee places, and when I'm there, I notice other people are there, and they're talking what? Business. They got their laptops open, and they're talking business, and sometimes I've watched deals be made, and handshakes are happening, and they walk out, and you see these like, yeah, we just sold our house in Starbucks, all right? Think the same thing here in the, the middle of bath time. This is what they would do. And so you'd be sitting there enjoying your bath while your clothes are getting clean and you're talking to your buddy and you're saying, you know what, yeah, how's it going for you? Yeah, it's going well. And so you would talk about business, right, while doing your business. I guess some of that was happening there. Um, so you're just kind of talking about, about life and all these things are beginning to happen. So now you keep that in mind. Again, Paul is talking about slices of life in the Roman world, right, And what you would do is you would take off your clothes to get them clean. You would change your clothes, take off your clothes, you would clean them. And Paul says at the beginning of chapter 4, you can't live like the Gentiles do. That's your old life. You need to take the old life, what does he say, take it off and put on your new life in Christ. So then he says in verse 24, uh, 20 through 24, that, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. Or we could say, that's not what you learned in church today. Living that life and that lifestyle, that's your old self. That's not what you learned in church today. He goes on, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, the clean self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Wow. Paul, once again, using this language and imagery known to the Roman world and to the Ephesians, And I think they're beginning to get it. And hopefully you're beginning to get some of his connections as well. He says in chapter 4, he says, Not only are you to walk worthy of the price that was paid for you, but you are also to walk distinctly different from the Gentiles. You need to walk different from the culture around you. You need to change your clothes. You need to clean your clothes. So it's important for us to understand that Paul's calling on these Ephesians, and I think he's calling us today to live radically different lives. And I think he's kind of laying this framework for us that's challenging them in every single part of their life, from the marketplace to the business place, right? He's doing the same for us. I think this is what his word does for us, is it challenges us regardless of where you go, in your family life, in your work life, in your play life, wherever you go, act, walk worthy, of the price that was paid for you because the conduct in your life is really going to change the community where God puts you. If we take our church and we partner our church with the power of the Holy Spirit, I believe that we can begin to see an impact happen within our community. We're already seeing that. We're serving serving close to 400 families every single Friday. Food. But we're not just giving them physical food, but we, there's people in lines who are part of our church who are encouraging them and praying for them and, and offering spiritual food and advice. And we want them to know that, that there's more to life than the old self, that, that you can put on something new, that, that you can have a, a rewarding way to live life. And so I believe that our conduct of our church family is already beginning and we're continuing to, to reflect the love of Christ where he's positioning each of us strategically within our communities. So we need to grasp what we read today in Ephesians is not just passive rules for some distant city, often Ephesus, but but these are, are active rules for you and I as followers of Jesus that we are to adopt within our lives in all circumstances and times that he's calling us to. In one resource I referenced this week, there was this quote by a priest many years ago, and he said, we do not need a church that will move with the world. We need a church that will move the world. We don't just need a church that's fluid and that moves with the world, but we need a church that moves the world, right? We want to be a church that that moves Pasco County, that, that does things so that when people see us, they're like, man, that church is doing some cool stuff. 
I don't get it. I don't understand it. I want to be a part of that. I think this was Jesus' prayer, too, for His people and for His church. He says, my prayer is not that you would remove them from the world, right? That's what He says, but that you would protect them in the world. Then He begins to talk about unity in that prayer in John 17 as well. And so, again, we were just coming off Daniel. A lot of this stuff is connecting with us, and we're kind of learning some similar things here as we're reminding ourselves of our mission of God's people, that we're a family that's devoted to reflect the love of Christ within our community because we want to move the world. Now Paul moves into Ephesians 5 here. He's told us to walk worthy, walk distinctly, and now he says, I want you to walk in love. And I'm showing kind of um, two, um, two versions, the NIV and the ESV here, because I just love the different phrasing and wording that they use. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love. There's that, that, that same lingo. He's using the same lingo there. Walk, walk, walk. If you have the NIV, a lot of times it says live, 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 right? Um, so follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The ESV says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. This word follow or this word imitators is this really cool little Greek word that I'm going to leave you with, and it's mimeomai. Everybody say mimeomai. Mimeomai. And it means to imitate. It means to act like. It means to follow. It's where we get our English word mimic. You see the connection there? Mimic, mimeomai, all right? There's a lot of similarities there. When I thought of this word this week, I thought of the word mimeograph. Um, my dad used to have a mimeograph machine. If you're, um, depending on how old you are, you maybe don't know what a mimeograph machine is, but it's a copy machine, and you would see this kind of this thing roll around, and it smelled like stinky ink. Um, and that's how we used to make our bulletins. That's how my dad made our bulletins years and years and years ago. At one of our churches in Ohio, he had a mimeograph machine, and that was like on the cutting edge of church, right? Anyways, so that's mimeograph, right? So mimeo my. And Paul says, just as it is natural for an earthly child to mimic or for an earthly child to imitate his earthly father, so it should be just as natural for a spiritual child to imitate, to mimic your heavenly father. You get what he's saying? If you've been parents, and if you're not a parent, you've had a parent at some point, and so you can understand some of what I'm going to say, but you understand how this idea of your kids acting and behaving so much like you, you don't even have to teach them. They just watch you. And here, Paul is using this analogy and he's saying, I, I, I need you to imitate God in this context. And how you do that is you do that by walking in love. That's one of the characteristics here that he's using about God. And love denies self. It's willing to give up self-interest for God's sake. And so love, again, it's, un, it's, it's not selfish. And so we should be able to give up ourselves in order to be obedient to him. And so this also means to, um, to follow, to obey, to live in relationship with him. And then and when we live with this attitude toward God, we please Him just as this pleasant aroma pleases the one who smells it. Jesus became the sacrifice for our sins. So he's using some sacrifice terminology here, and we won't kind of go off on that too much. But, um, but here, Paul again is saying we, we must reflect His love and become a living sacrifice that's obedient to him. I thought of Romans 12 this week. I won't read the whole thing, but I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to, prevent, to present your bodies as living sacrifices. I learned years ago the problem with a living sacrifice, that's you and me. The problem with living sacrifices is that we always crawl off the altar, right? We, don't, we crawl off the altar. It's hard for us to always be consistent in our walk. It's hard for us to always be sold out and surrendered and faithful. And Paul urges us to be a living sacrifice, a living example to our communities that are around us. I think there are times in our life, times in my life, where I'm really, really pleased about the way I handled something. And I, and I leave and I'm like, yeah, score, I did good, right? And there are other times that I'm like, why did I do that? Or why didn't I do this? You ever have that? You're just kicking yourself or hitting yourself, right? And you're like, I wish... I would have just said this in that circumstance. I feel like 
It just would have led into some other conversation, and we kick ourselves over those things. And so I think those, are, those happen, and that's just us crawling off the altar. Or it's also just us learning to, to trust the Holy Spirit's going to guide us and move us through that. So we go back to Ephesians 5, and I love the way the, the message version says it. It says, watch what God does, then you do it. Simple. You watch what God does, then you do it. Like children learn proper behavior from their parents. Mostly what God does is, is love you. That's his, one of his greatest character traits, we could say. One of them, right? Keep company with him and learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious, but it was extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us. I need you to love like that, Paul says to the church of Ephesus. I have five kids, and most of you know that, and I don't have to teach them like I said before, but it's pretty profound to watch my kids as they begin to their behavior. I don't notice it as much until someone says, Paul, do you see what your boys are doing? They like walk just like you. They, they talk just like you. They behave just like you. That's kind of scary, right? And so, but it, you know, and the same thing with my wife. And look, look at your girls and they, the way they look. And they look so much beautiful like your wife. And see all those characteristics and all those traits, right? You don't even have to teach them. It just kind of happens that they adopt those mannerisms naturally. And the Apostle Paul says, wouldn't it be amazing if people would say the same thing about you in your relationship to God as your Heavenly Father? They would tap you on the shoulder and they say, I can't believe it, but you look so much like your dad. You look so much like your heavenly father. As I've observed how you walk in Ephesus and how you walk in Pasco County and, and the ways that you're behaving in your conduct, my goodness, you are acting so much like your heavenly father. And Paul has been outlining for us kind of these certain family characteristics in Ephesians 4 and 5, this kind of certain behavior, certain conduct for us. And he's saying, if you're a part of the family of God, if you're in this family, this is how your family behaves. So if this is you, this is your conduct. This is who you are. This is now what you do. And so he's kind of helping us to kind of get all of that. Um, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. I love Paul includes this other little line. It sounds a lot like Daniel, doesn't it? Remember that line that Daniel, um, that Daniel heard from the Lord, right? You are highly esteemed. You are greatly loved. And here we see it again in Ephesians. You are dearly loved children. This week I left my house a little late, which was a mistake, and it was on Wednesdays when Pasco, <clears throat> Pasco County School opened up. As soon as I rounded the corner, what did I see? A school bus right there, boom, it's parked there. I'm like, my first thought was, I'll just take this back road and dart around it, right? But I didn't because that would be bad. <laughs> so I get a ticket probably. So I just parked there and I waited. And it felt like an eternity for like five minutes. And I'm watching these parents interact with their kids. These are tiny little ones. And they're like boarding the bus. And I watched this one dad and he's kind of watching. He's close and he's watching his little ones. And he stayed there the whole time. And his eyes were like laser focused on that little kid. The kid walked in. You see the kind of the, um, the, one of the helpers there is writing something down, I guess, her name or something like that. And she begins to walk. And he's just kind of watching her walk down all the way to the bus and sits down. And then the stop sign goes in. And he's like still laser focused. And the bus begins to pull off and leave, and he's like, all right, I'm good, you know, and he just leaves, and so I, I thought about this week, you know, understanding this love that we as parents have for our kids, and that your parents had for you. Our love for our earthly children does not even compare to the love that our Heavenly Father has for us. His love is infinitely greater than the most profound love that I could ever have for my kids. His love is infinitely greater. Paul gives us this other answer to how we can be imitators of God. He's kind of throwing this little plug out for his love. And then he says, I need you to walk in the way of love. As you walk into Ephesus, walk in love. As you walk out into Pasco County, walk in love. If you're a student here today, as you walk into your middle school, as you walk into your high school, you got to walk in love. And it'll probably be some of the most difficult challenges that are that our high school, our middle school kids will ever have. As you interact with those in authority over you, kids, you walk in love, not like everybody else, because that's who you were. 
Adults, as you walk in your workplace, you walk in love. Yeah, and that means loving the person in the cubicle next to you who you wish didn't return to work this year. You love them. You walk in love. You reflect the love of Christ. Church, as you and I walk in our communities where we eat, where we work, and where we play, you had better reflect the love of Christ to the watching world. Not because of me, because this is what Scripture is telling us to do. To walk in love means to walk in a manner that is worthy of the calling to which you have been called. You were bought with a price, and his shed blood was that price. Are you standing up to that? Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, if we backed up and not parking here a lot, you don't have to read some of this a lot on your own this week, but kind of talks about some of those ways that we can walk in love, and it says you get rid of all bitterness. Oh, man, that's a tough one. Rage and anger, oh man, that's another tough one. Brawling and slander, Among, along with every form of malice, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. So again, we see this idea of imitating, this idea of copying, of following who God is. To walk in love. It's not written here in Ephesians 5. I don't see it as an option in our life. I read this as a command in our life not an option. If you're claiming to have been bought with the price, it is a command that you and I begin to behave like it. Again, I use this example of parenting here, um, and I think we can understand this as we begin to kind of wrap this up. Maybe you've had kids and you've kind of sent them off to grandma's house, or maybe you sent your kids off to a, a friend's house or to some swimming party. And I don't know about you, but we've had these interactions with, within our five kids over the years, and my wife and I are driving them, and, and uh, we might have this little discussion before we stop and get out of the car. And so we're like, now look at me. Just a couple of things I need to go over with you, right? And we, and we, st- we just start launching it. And they're like so excited, they're not even paying attention. They're like, no, look at me, right? You get their face back, and they're now locked on your, and you're like, hey, I just need you to do a couple of things. Before you get out of the car, I just want you to understand this. Okay, Johnny, here's what I want you to do. You're going to smile at Mr. and Mrs. Smith when you go in their house, and you are going to tell them thank you, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm going to do this, that's no problem. And we begin to go on down this other things we want them to do. And when you leave the swimming party, right? You dry yourself off first. Don't you dare enter their house when you're dripping wet, okay? You dry yourself off and you sit out there and you be patient and you be kind and you had better say those two words, thank you, before you leave. You got it? Yeah, I got it. And then you leave that little child to do their thing and you just pray like mad that it's all going to work out according to your plan and you're not going to get a phone call a little bit later because your family honor is now at stake, right? It's on the shoulders of that little monster who you just kicked out of the car, (laughs) the honor of your family, right? And there they are, beginning to represent the nature of your family is on the shoulders of that kid. And God the Father, through the Holy Spirit, through the pen of the Apostle Paul, says to the church, look at me, look at me. I'm all excited, no, 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 look at me. I want you to get a few things. I want you to walk in love because you are my dearly loved child. Look at me. Do you remember the price that I paid for you? I died for you. And I would have died for you if you were the only child on earth. I died for you. Now, in a few moments, I'm going to kick you out of the car. (laughs) And I'm going to trust so you're going to bring honor to my family name. Can you do that for me? It's an amazing privilege for us to be a child of the king. And with that privilege comes a phenomenal responsibility. You are my child. That's your calling. That's who you are. Now act like it. That's your conduct. That's what you do. Reflecting the love of Christ to those around you is what he needs us to do. Because the watching world is going to make deductions about the very nature of God himself on on the expressions of how we live our life of children of God. 
and something of the nature of God's family, and I will add our Gulf U Grace family, is, is riding on the shoulders of you. In a second, I'm going to kick you out. And I'm one of them. I'm going to leave these back two doors. And God's going to take me different places, and he's going to have me rub shoulders with my neighbors. And God's honor right, is riding on my shoulders. That how I act and behave and love others and walk worthy and walk distinctly different from the world can literally help others to see that Jesus can change lives. But it all comes down to me reflecting the love of Christ. That was your old life. You now have a new life. How are you doing? Two little questions for you as we close. On a scale of 1 to 10, how do you feel you are doing at reflecting the love of Christ among your neighbors? When I say neighbors, I'm not talking about those on flank either side of your house, but I'm talking about your neighbors, people you know on a regular basis that you come in contact with. It could be those neighbors on either side of your house or across the street. In my sense, when I look at this question, I'm thinking specifically of my neighbors because I love my neighbors. Recently, I had a really close conversation that my neighbor brought up. We started talking about life. Um, I feel like God's working in my neighbor's heart. And I love my neighbor, Jim. My neighbor, Jim, is this amazing man who will do anything for anybody, but I'm not so sure he knows Jesus. And it's riding on my shoulders to reflect the love of Christ to him. What do you feel might be the next right step for you as you work towards reflecting the love of Christ among your neighbors, and I'll add, among your community? What's the next right step? I'm the kind of guy who can get overwhelmed by details, and so for me, I just need one step. And so I just want you to just think of one step for you, however you think that step is. What, what is it? Maybe for you, it's just, you know what? I'm just going to start. I'm going to like bring my neighbor cookies. That's just your step. I'm just going to start opening the door. I'm not saying you go knock on the door and you open your Bible and say, Romans 3.23 says this. I want you to listen closely. All right. Sometimes that salvation is a process, right, that God works. And so just by the way you conduct your life and live your life, you're living out God's word to them, right? And so maybe you just need to just think of some intentional things that you're going to do. Get them flowers, or maybe you're going through a hard time and you just want to pray for them. You're going to tell them you're going to pray for them. Or it's that person you work next to. What is the one step that you can do to work towards reflecting the love of Christ among those people?